Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Bailey, Editor-in-Chief of Catheterization and Cardiovascular Interventions. And today I'm pleased to be able to interview Dr. Michael Jaff, Director of the Vascular Center, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, on behalf of his co-investigators on their results from the Hercules trial. Dr. Jaff, I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts about the impact of renal vascular hypertension as well as the outcomes from your trial demonstrating significant reduction in systolic blood pressure following renal artery stenting in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Billy. It's really an honor uh, on behalf of the investigators we're thrilled to uh, have this opportunity. This is a very hot topic in vascular medicine and for uh, interventionists across the world for a host of reasons. One, in renal artery stenosis due to atherosclerosis is very common. Secondly, there are two major impacts of renal artery disease on patients. One is it's an independent marker of early and premature cardiac related death. And that's even been known when compared to patients with coronary artery disease and no renal artery stenosis, compared to those patients with renal artery stenosis and no known coronary disease. Turns out that renal artery stenosis is a much stronger predictor of early heart attacks and cardiovascular related deaths. So from a survival standpoint, it's got great impact. And then the other thing is obviously on how to manage these patients. These patients present with difficult to control hypertension, accelerated chronic kidney disease, and it's a lot of kind of hand wringing as to how to manage these patients. There have been two widely quoted internationally done clinical trials that have suggested that in certain patient subtypes, there's no real measurable benefit of endovascular therapy for renal artery disease compared to optimal medical management. So the confusion out there among all of us, those who see the patients clinically and those who have to make the decisions about intervention or not, the confusion is just rampant and uh, we're struggling. So. The goals of the Hercules trial were to try and identify a subset of patients that we thought de facto would benefit from an artery intervention and then prove it. So we took patients who really did have tough to control hypertension and who were appropriately medicated on an ACE inhibitor, on a diuretic, not just left to the whim of the investigator, and then who had real anatomic renal artery stenosis. So we took those patients and then treated all of them. And we followed what happened to their blood pressure and kidney function over time. In addition, we tried to predict which patients would benefit using a biomarker, brain natriuretic peptide, which had been reported twice before in smaller series to predict clinical improvement if their BNP levels were high before intervention. So that was really the, those were the basic tenets of the, of the Hercules trial. Mike, one of the uh, important features was the uh, improvement that you did see in this patient population. Uh, that's a little different than other trials uh, have shown, and I wonder if you have thoughts about why this carefully selected population uh, seem to have more benefit than other studies have shown. Yeah, I think you're right, Steve. We were uh, really quite impressed with the magnitude of systolic blood pressure response, particularly in those patients whose systolic blood pressures at entry were high. So, for example, in those patients whose entry systolic blood pressure was over 180 millimeters of mercury, the response to renal artery stenting was profound, more than 40 millimeter mercury drop. And in fact, I challenge any multi-drug trial to mirror the impact of blood pressure lowering that we saw in the subsegment of patients who had really high blood pressure to start. And quite honestly, I think the reason for that is all around what you said, patient selection. We chose patients who had tough to control hypertension on good antihypertensive regimens with real anatomic hemodynamically significant renal artery stenosis and then alleviated that. And so I think we had an impact on renin production and therefore had a reduction in systolic blood pressure. So it all goes back to the initial comment you made that it's patient selection 
if you took somebody who was on amlodipine 2.5 milligrams a day for a systolic blood pressure of 150 and whose renal artery stenosis was 50 percent with no gradient I think it'd be foolhardy to think that that person would get a measurable benefit but on the other hand if you took a Hercules patient who had real renal artery stenosis more than 70 percent and a systolic blood pressure that could be controlled on good regimens I think you can anticipate a clinical benefit So, Dr. Jaff, now that we're seeing new therapies, uh, now with uh, ablative renal therapy such as that seen in simplicity, uh, I'm wondering what we might expect in terms of outcomes, or what you think uh, will be happening in terms of, of renal artery stenting as opposed to uh, direct uh, renal nerve ablation for treatment of hypertension. Well, that's a great question. There are many people who think that uh, stenting for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is a dying uh, opportunity, that there will be few and far between, at least in the United States, largely due to regulatory and reimbursement challenges. I'd argue that point. Uh, although the CORAL trial results are not yet available and we don't really know what they're going to show, the fact is I think uh, Hercules and other soon-to-be uh, started trials are going to identify patients in whom the likelihood of clinical benefit is high. Now, what do I think is going to happen? I think what's going to happen is with the advent of renal denervation and the incredible results that we're seeing now going out to five years of reductions in blood pressure in patients who, by the way, had normal renal arteries, uh, you're going to see more patients with atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Why? Because I think people are going to start screening for this. In order to do renal denervation, by definition, the renal arteries at entry have to be normal, at least to get into the trials. So people are going to be looking for patients with, quote unquote, primary hypertension to make sure that their renal arteries are normal so they can undergo renal denervation. And they're going to find patients, particularly in those, uh, the patients you care for with coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease, who are going to have, by definition, renal artery stenosis. So I actually think this is going to result in a higher identification rate of renal artery disease, but we'll wait and see what happens. Well, I think you're right. I think that because of our perceived limitations in treatment or perceived lack of benefit that people have been nihilistic about looking for it because there's not a good way to treat it. Given that, uh, and, and the experience that your group have now with a large number of patients, do you have thoughts about who that correct patient is that would be considered, since we don't have a biomarker, since the BNP didn't turn out to predict patients in your study, uh, who would you uh, recommend to be thought about for looking for renal artery stenosis and then treating renal artery stenosis? So I think for looking for renal artery disease, I'd stick to the clinical clues that have, that have uh, held the test of time. So patients who've had hypertension that's been well controlled for a long time, that suddenly require the addition of many more medications to control it. I think that's a clinical clue. I think any patient that develops azotemia in the face of an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor antagonist, they should be screened for renal artery disease. Uh, people with a discrepancy in renal size, where one kidney is 12 centimeters and the other is 7, I think we should think about renal artery disease. And in patients whose hypertension is tough to control, in the face of good antihypertensive therapy, particularly if they have a background of coronary disease and or peripheral artery disease, we ought to be looking for them. Now, who to treat? I can only tell you that from my own judgment. Um, I think patients who have really tough to control high blood pressure on an ACE inhibitor and a, a diuretic whose blood pressure remains high and you've proven that their renal artery stenosis is hemodynamically important, I think those patients or have a good chance of benefiting from renal artery intervention. I think patients who have recurrent cardiorenal syndromes like flash pulmonary edema without an obvious myocardial ischemia as the culprit and global renal ischemia, I think those patients should be considered for uh, renal artery intervention. The hardest ones, the ones I'm really going to hedge on for you, are those patients who have real renal artery disease and chronic kidney disease in which there's no other explanation for their impaired renal function. This is a tough one, Steve, and I, I don't have a good answer. I can't tell you that 
a creatinine above a certain amount warrants intervention below a certain amount doesn't kidney size matters you kind of put all this into the pot but it's our hope that at least in some of these patients the coral trial will shed some light and future trials will help well i think you're right we're certainly going to be awaiting the results of these important randomized trials to give us some of these insights but it's wonderful that you and your investigators have shared with us uh, some hope about uh, patients that are likely to respond, and we look forward to continued reports from uh, your research on who it is that might benefit in this uh, very important and clinically impactful disease.